patient to come here. It's a real pleasure for me to come here for various reasons. Uh, especially because I'm Romanian. So, the, this is the title of my talk. And uh, it's a bit speculative, I'm going from the beginning. It's about the uh, certain ideas which arise in the last couple of years, uh, mainly in the framework of spin theory. Uh, so that's the part of the talk. First of all, I, I will tell you, so uh, most of the talk is actually a review and a couple of uh, more recent things which I'm working in, but most of it is a review. So first of all, I will tell you something about very well known things in state theory and then in four dimensions. Then about this, what people call the last game of state theory, and the technological proposal emerged, emerged from it, which has the virtue of uh, being uh, part of the people. And then some issues related to this uh, feature, which is the issue of the uh, what is called modularized organization, and we'll see what it's about. And then, then some, uh, if I have time, some uh, couple of words about the possible future realizations of this uh, landscape, which I will have time. So, the project for the experts. So I'll start with uh, very well known things. So, as you know, the, the string theory is a one dimensional assembled object which moves, so it uh, spans a two dimensional world sheet surface. The particles are the oscillator, the our uh, space time particles are oscillators, which have a mass which are proportional to certain mass scale, it's a scale. And uh, uh, the uh, stability of the corresponding uh, of the string series uh, ask typically to uh, have super string constructions, which is in 10 dimensions. So the, the first observation is that the string series is in 10 dimensions. And when you go to the fifth series unit, when you try to decouple massive states, you <coughs> find uh, a series which contains gravity, contains Yankee series. These are super gravity series coupled to uh, Young means, super young means. And even in 10 dimensions, you can have a kind of a landscape. So now you understand what landscape means. Landscape means several solutions if you want, several series, just in this. So even in 10 dimensions, or in <coughs> dimensions, you have several. In 10 dimensions, there are five string series. There are two heterotic series based on cross strings, gauge group C8 times C8 or S32. You have a type 1. Uh, series which contains both open and closed strings. You have type 2a, type 2b series, which contain, which are based on closed strings, but contain also some open strings. And there is also in 11 dimensional series related to all these kind of uh, string series, which is 11 dimensional square gravity. All of these uh, different corners are related by certain relations which are not discussed. These are the web of dualities. <coughs> so part of the, uh, you know, Already in 10 dimensions, the string theory was not really proposed to me. When you go to 4 dimensions, uh, you will have a 4 dimensional space where you live in. You have an internal space. This internal space have, can have very different properties. These very different properties can create in 4 dimensions what people call landscape. To be more precise, string theory has an internal space which uh, can support various types of if you want fluxes like uh, magnetic fields, for example, in compact space, or other kind of fluxes. And you'll have probably a talk later on, uh, on this. So that's a cartoon of a compact space, of the internal space. And you see here you have various kind of uh, uh, subspaces or cycles, which can contain uh, fluxes, an integral of a, cer of a certain field uh, over this kind of surface is different from zero. I call them uh, by, uh, and they are uh, described by some integers because of the uh, real kind of condition. And uh, this is a cartoon for our space. And the, uh, the observables, the physical parameters in our space, like cosmological constant, mass of various particles, the uh, couplings, depend on the properties of the internal space. The internal space is described also by some uh, fields which describe, for example, the fluctuation of the internal space, for example, the, the volume, think of a sphere which fluctuates. These are uh, moduli, called moduli fields. 
then physical quantities depend both on these quantum expectation values of scalar kind of modular fields and the possible kind of flux is in the compact space. Now, when you, because of this dependence, and because of the fact that this vacuum expectation value of these fluxes can have lots of different values, we can generate in four dimensions a huge number of values of physically distinct uh, uh, vacua or physically distinct series. Physically distinct in the sense that different gauge groups in four dimensions, <coughs> different number of generations, different physical parameters like cosmological constant, mixed mass, gauge coupling, power coupling, and so on. By huge, and these are some very good estimates by a very group of people working on these kind of subjects. But huge means something on the order of 10 to the 100, 10 to the 500. Uh, the number, I, don't, I think it's not very important. What is important is that it's a very good number. Uh, since uh, in, in uh, parts of my talk there will be some motions which will appear, I'll just flash, and again I'm sorry for this loudness because there's a lack of time, just a kind of dictionary. You'll hear uh, some words. You'll, you'll, you already heard the uh, two or close things. You'll hear very often and later on by other people the, the word deep brains. Deep brains are some uh, objects where uh, open strings can end. And these are dynamical objects, objects can fluctuate, which can have, for example, T space dimensions plus the time. That's the this kind of object contains a, uh, has a mass per unit volume which called the tension, which is like a kind of mass, which is always positive, and which describes the coupling to the, to the gravity and to a field which is called a Dirac scalar field. This object is coupled also to a kind of antisymmetric tensor, and that's the analog of the coupling of a particle. It's like the coupling of a particle to a point field. A particle is a zero dimension object that couples to one form, the electromagnetic field. A deep brain couples to the plus one field and contains also a charge. This is famous Ramon charge. Why it is important? It is very important because uh, when I talk about the flux earlier on, flux is just mean uh, some background expectation values for the deep cells associated to, uh, to this uh, field. Part of its flux is from this kind of problem. You will hear another uh, kind of notion, which is an uh, orientifold. An orientifold is a string theory in which the uh, two kind of oscillators which propagate on the closed string, you can have oscillators propagating like that or like that, are identified by a certain operation, and just, a, just a one kind of uh, oscillator. And this uh, operation also generates some uh, non-dynamical objects like mirrors, mirrors which under which if you have a normal in brain, you have to have a mirror, uh, uh, a pair, just as a configuration to be invariant under reflection. So these are non-dynamical objects which have the very strange property of having a negative mass, a, neg a negative charge is less unusual, but have a negative mass and that's possible because they are non dynamical. So these are the kind of ingredients which appear in most of the constructions, uh, of thin construction nowadays, which also appear in the constructions of this uh, very large number of actors that people are talking about. Uh, I can give you a very simple example of a, of a, a flux. And I think I'll uh, flash it very fast because Ralph Bumahagan will discuss in much more detail about it. And that's uh, the simplest one, which is just an internal magnetic field. I told you that there is an internal space in string theory, which is typically six dimensional. You can have a magnetic field with indices pointing in these directions, not in our space time, it's a magnetic field within this is in this internal space. And this kind of, uh, mine, uh, this kind of uh, fields can couple to open strings. To, uh, they can couple to the endpoints of the open strings. 
the advantages of this kind of flux, uh, which makes it very particular, which, and uh, I uh, advise you to, to go to the seminar by uh, Ralph, is that the string theory can be exactly quantized in, separate, in this setup. We know exactly to compute the, the full uh, string propagation in this setup. And moreover, it has a very simple interpretation as uh, this kind of setup is equivalent to a model in which you have this kind of grains I talked about before in which they are rotated by certain angles. Uh, because you have a full uh, uh, lecture on it, I'm not going into detail. But let me just tell you that when you put a certain flux, and this example I just gave you, it's a very explicit, a simple one, it's just a magnetic field. A lot of things do happen, and they, they do happen really in the examples which people can the visual. First of all, when you put a, a, a flux like a magnetic field, you can very easily generate chirality, for example. So one of the reasons to put flux is to, to generate chirality. Why? Because if you put a magnetic field, let's say, in a compact uh, two dimensions, so five, six are compact uh, or internal uh, coordinates, then by the index theorem, if you start, for example, in a six dimensional space time, and you have a because in times of torus, because of the index theorem, you know that you generate a net number of fermions in four dimensions because the number of masses left-handed minus right-handed fermions is proportional to the integral of this field over the compact space. So you need to generate chirality. It's one of the reasons to talk about these objects, fluxes. Another reason is that you can, when you start with superstring in ten dimensions, uh, you have a, a supersymmetry. When you go to four dimensions, you have a lot of supersymmetry. There were a lot of supersymmetries, and for homological reasons, or even for other kind of reasons, you'd like to break partly or completely supersymmetry. For example, in order to make contact with this standard model of uh, uh, particle physics, you would like to break completely supersymmetry. There is no supersymmetry in nature. This is not observed after the present dimensions. When you have fluxes of the type of the magnetic field, because of the standard couplings of the uh, magnetic field with the helicity, except that in this case we are talking about internal helicity, not our space-time helicity, then you generate the difference between uh, fermions and boson masses, because fermions and bosons have different internal helicity. If you start with bosons and fermions in, let's say, 10 dimensions, when you write their helicities, you realize that they have different helicities, and therefore you generate a different of masses, which do break space. These are just two simple arguments uh, in favor of putting this kind of fluxes. First of all, in certain cases, you can exactly quantize things theory. This will not be the case for the, the other type of fluxes that I discuss. However, it is true for this kind of magnetic fields. Second, you generate hierarchy breaks per symmetry. So these are good reasons to go on. Now, you can immediately realize that once you start to put this kind of objects, you can put a lot of different kind of fluxes. So, obviously, we can generate, from a four-dimensional perspective, a lot of different models, <coughs> a lot of different vacuum, and therefore a landscape feature of string theory. Now, let me give you uh, a possible application to this kind of uh, many vacua, which became a little bit of a philosophy. So, what I'll tell you a little bit now, it's part of the physics, maybe mostly an ideology, but I think it's very nice, and it's an argument given by Dusan Borchinsky a couple of years ago. In a slightly different context, but we adapt it to our uh, uh, discussion we had before. The idea is the following, and they give it uh, in a very uh, simple uh, cartoon kind of model, which you can imagine with come from a string theory, but the argument is a little bit more than that. Suppose we are in four dimensions, you come, you have the gravity, you have a bare cosmological constant, which for our purposes would be negative. And you have some uh, antisymmetric tensor fields. Here it's a three-form antisymmetric tensor with a four-form field strength, but it can be something more general. So it's not very important which kind of uh, antisymmetric which kind of antisymmetric tensor will be. Here will be a three-form. But as you, uh, you, you, you will see from the arguments, uh, the result is slightly more general. When we write the field equations for this uh, three form, uh, we realize there is a solution with a constant field strength. We satisfy the field equations. Uh, epsilon is the 
total symmetric uh, epsilon index, uh, plus or minus one. And this, when you put it back, you, you effectively find a new contribution of cosmological constant. So you start with a theory that says a kind of a bare cosmological constant, let's say negative, coming from a certain from a microscopic theory with a negative cosmological constant. <coughs> this is, by the way, compatible with uh, uh, superstrings. You can get a negative cosmological constant. However, if because of some field which has a certain background expectation value, you do generate a new contribution of cosmological constant. Now, imagine that this contribution is quantized. Why should it be quantized? Well, for example, for the previous discussions, if you put some, uh, this is a flux, if you put a flux in, a com in, a, in an internal space because of the Dirac quantization condition, this constant will be quantized. And it's, it's enough for our proposals to, to stick to this picture. Most of has a slightly different uh, proposal, but for our, uh, from our discussion, it's enough to consider that this kind of field really doesn't live in four dimension, even in higher dimension, and the integral of the compact space is quantized. This is, gives a contribution, a real cosmological constant, which is quantized in some units. Suppose now that you have several contributions of this type. So suppose if you have several contributions of this type, what will happen is the following. You will have the contribution of cosmological constant, which was original one, and again, let's suppose it is negative. It has to be negative for our considerations, actually. And you have some contributions coming from these fluxes, which are quantized. So they have some effective charge, some charges like the electron charge, times some integers. So these ni's are integers, and this j is the number of fluxes, and that's the whole cosmological constant. Now, Let's try, let's take an explicit example with two fluxes. And what, is, what you see here is the following. Uh, <coughs> what you see here is, is all, uh, all this uh, two dimensional lattice is the possible values of these uh, integers which are cut off at some value. Because for reasons which I, I cannot explain here, these integers actually do not go really up to infinity. There is a constraint if you want on the total number of flux typically, which you can put in the compact space in, uh, in most of the models in the literature. So what you see here is this, just this different number uh, of uh, values of these n's and the uh, here is the uh, value basically uh, lambda bear is uh, the value though of the cosmological original cosmological constant which can be for example very very large but you see that this very large and negative number can be compensated by this contribution and if you put this plus this to be approximately zero you find something which is a, a, a circle it's a circle if you say that the, the uh, cosmological constant at the end is maybe not exactly zero, but it's something like positive and very small, like ten, like ten to the zero <coughs> from volts, you are putting uh, a signal, seek here a thickness of ten to the zero from volts. So what you see in this in this red uh, area is the number of vacua or points which are compatible with a total cosmological constant, which is of the order of let's say ten to the zero from volts. So imagine that the radius is a order of time mass, huge, 10 to the 19 GB. However, this uh, red uh, region here has a, uh, this thickness in the order of 10 to the minus from volt. Now, this new ideology is the following. Of course, the number of the points which is, which is in this red area is very small compared to the total number of points. So, it didn't solve anything. But suppose that this number, the total number of points, the, the real total number of points is huge like 10 to the 200, 300. Then, if in the red uh, region you have a number of points which is of order 100, 1000, 10 to the 10, 10 to 50, something like that, then even if you didn't solve the cosmological constant, you can accommodate a small value of the cosmological constant because the number of points here can be pretty large. It can be something like 10 to the 50 out of a total number which is 10 to the 300 to 10 to the 400. 
So, accommodation of a small cosmological constant means that we need a certain number of points in the red area. Now, the total number of points is proportional to this uh, area. So, more and more fluxes you put, more and more big, uh, bigger and bigger the, the surface will be. Because it's basically the volume, uh, is the volume of a uh, uh, unit at <coughs> some point, uh, of a unit uh, surface in a higher dimension. So, the bigger the number of fluxes, and the bigger the radius, the bigger will be the, uh, the red volume. So you see that we find something very strange, which is the bigger the bare cosmological constant, like Planck mass, the bigger you have more points in the red region. And this goes better and better by putting more and more fluxes. Putting more and more fluxes, which you have more and more vacuum. That's a change in the philosophy. So this is a little bit uh, one of the basic uh, ideas uh, telling that the more and more vacuum you, you have, the easier it is to accommodate a small cosmological constant. And uh, another non trivial uh, aspect of this proposal, which is probably nice, is that for the first time people didn't, people didn't try to uh, find dynamic reason or symmetry reason to have a zero cosmological constant. We know the cosmological constant is not zero, actually. It's very small that it's not zero, and we are more and more sure that it's not zero. And most of the mechanisms which were uh, discussed in the past were trying to use either symmetries to put exactly to zero the cosmological constant, or a dynamical principle in order to drive it to zero. Here we cannot have it zero because the, uh, these integers here, so this contribution from fluxes are quantized, so you see that these points are discrete. So you can find points in this red area generically. But it's very hard to find a point which will have exactly zero cosmological constant because this is a certain number, let's say, a very complicated number. And here you have some charges times some integers. So it's natural to get a set of integers such that the sum of this to be small, but it's unnatural to get it zero. There is no reason to get zero. Why, why is it natural for it to be small? Or, yeah, I don't see anything which would say that this circle is. No, it's a, it's a complicated question. Let's say in, in the, simplest, uh, primitive, the, the simplest primitive answer, you need effective charges to be smaller than the observed cosmological constant. That's true. So this is not necessarily that nice. Now, if you, if you go to more and more number of classes, it becomes better and better, of course. But I, I agree it's not completely obvious that uh, you find something very small. Now, Again, the low energy physics, like cosmological constant, but not only cosmological constant, and everything else, and let's talk about one minute about the other parameter, mysterious parameter of the standard model, which is the Higgs mass. We didn't see yet, yet the Higgs particle, but we believe for various reasons that the mass of the Higgs should be uh, light, of the order of the electric scale, and the, all the other parameters should be functions of all of these fluxes. Uh, vacuum expectation value of scalar fields uh, coming from string theory. And therefore, in this vast, uh, vast different vacua, you have different low energy physics. So, this is in principle a disturbing question because somehow to have why the standard model uh, is it as it is, why the standard model, why the gauge model is as it is, why there are three generations. Why the gauge couplings are as they are, and they tend to unify in a certain supersymmetric extension? You should try to address these questions from this new ideology point of view. To some extent, this new ideology can, can create some uh, problems uh, philosophically. So people try to address questions like the statistical distribution of cosmological constant, for example, along the lines we just discussed, from the Higgs mass. Uh, this picture actually inspired a new theological scenario, which was uh, called split supersymmetry, which is the following. For a very long time, people invoked low energy supersymmetry in order to understand why the electric scale is much, much smaller than any other natural scale in any kind of extension of the standard model, like gravity unification or Planck mass gravitation. And the only kind of uh, natural solution the 
there were several kind of proposals. The original ones, the, the other alternative, which was technical, which means dynamic velocity braking, is more or less excluded from <coughs> the experiments, more or less. And the low energy supersymmetry, the super part that's in TV range, was involved for a very long time in order to protect the electroweak scale with respect to the, any other kind of scale. Now, if we start to accept that for the cosmological constant, the cosmological constant, if you have a huge number of vacua, is not really a problem, but somehow it just tells you that you, you, you are a huge number of vacua, you, and we live in the one in which the life can uh, arise, or let me not enter into this discussion, but uh, some of you already guessed that this smells a bit like an atomic principle to some extent. But then we could also try to abandon the, uh, the, electro the low energy supersymmetry as a solution to this, uh, what is called ELRT problem. Why the electro scale is very small compared to the other scales. However, it is very, the idea of supersymmetry at high energy, for example, is very appealing for various reasons. Probably, as you know, when you, take, when you try to make supersymmetry local, uh, Einstein gravity is predicted. There's something uh, remarkable. When you any kind of uh, string theory which has a chance to be stable or consistent, supersymmetry appears in a way or another. And string theory is the only, uh, one of the only candidates in order to quantize gravity nowadays. And therefore, we believe that supersymmetry should exist one way or another, but we don't know at which scale. So this uh, proposal uh, suggests that actually, at the electroweak scale, you don't really have the, the whole uh, uh, superpartners. For example, you have the uh, one Higgs doublet, and you need the Higgs doublet in order to have the uh, electroweak symmetry and a perturbative physics. Because the, the mass of the electroweak doublet is proportional to the, to the electroweak wave times the coupling constant. <coughs> if you want this coupling constant to be small, you need a different light. The model predicts that uh, all fermions in, in the minimum supersymmetric extension standard model are at uh, electroweak scale. Why? For, uh, first of all, theoretically, you can understand that fermions can be protected by color symmetry. So it is likely that fermions, like gluinos, which is a pattern of the, of the gluon, it's in a the Higgs, and genus, pattern of the, the B boson, a vino. It is not impossible to imagine that they are protected by some kind of symmetry, and therefore they can stay light. However, all the other scalars, superpartners, which are not protected, and as we know, the scalars are much more difficult to protect, will have mass which is very, very big. Why is this? Uh, why this uh, uh, proposal receives some attention? Well, it receives some attention for two reasons. At least two reasons. First of all, you see that this proposal preserves some of the successes, most of the successes of the of the low energy supersymmetry. Low energy supersymmetry predicts basically two, pragmatically two things. Three. The first was the ERP, uh, the protection of the airway scale. So this is gone here, unfortunately, and that's the uh, uh, worst part of it. However, the low edge supersymmetry predicted also a dark matter candidate, which is the lightest supersymmetry particle. So this is here. This is one linear combination of the states, some of the states. Typically, can be uh, this object here, Vino, uh, can be a hexino. Most likely, uh, a neutral particle. <coughs> Uh, low energy supersymmetry predicts a very nice gauge coupling unification at energy scales around 10 to the 16 GB. It's not completely obvious to see <coughs> what happens here, but it's still preserved. And one way to see it is, for example, squarks and leptons come into complete H5 matrices. And it, as you probably know, if you have a present, complete representation of SU5, they don't matter into the pattern unification. So this unifies actually up to, uh, to one in the detail, uh, uh, as well as the minimum supersymmetric extension of the standard model. So this model preserves uh, the basic success of supersymmetry, supersymmetry and has one advantage, which is basically put it by hand. Minimum supersymmetric standard model starts to have some what is called flavor problems. 
there are some frameable problems in the sense that uh, squarks and slaptons typically, if they are light, they can produce flavor changes to current defects, which in the standard model were beautifully taken into account by the G mechanism. In the supersymmetric case, the G mechanism is only partially efficient. There are new uh, diagrams appear, appearing, and there is a real flavor uh, changing problem, like KT bar mixing, CP violation problems, which ask for these parts and leptons to be either heavy enough, either the, uh, the pattern of supersymmetry breaking to be extremely fine tuned. This is what is called universality problems, minimum square gravity problems. So if all these scales are very, very heavy, you solve all these problems. So that's the things. These are a couple of reasons why this model uh, receives some attention. Now, the model by itself is not tied in any way to the, this huge number of vacua. It's motivated by it. You don't really need to, uh, to use this ideology I told before. But uh, if you want people who never try to, to involve such such uh, wild constructions before all this uh, landscape ideology came from. Now, there are other, other type of outcome of this kind of uh, proposal, like for example, because of the fact that the uh, squares are very heavy, the gluinos cannot decay. Gluinos should decay through squares. So if squares are very heavy, gluinos are very, are very uh, light, the gluinos become very long lived. The same for the genomes. So there is a hope that uh, uh, can produce some exotic hadrons, and this kind of hadrons can be seen. There are actually very serious constraints on this, so this acts as a constraint on the model, but it doesn't kill it completely. Now, uh, this model, is a, if you want, it's a pragmatic uh, attitude. Unfortunately, it's not a real, uh, it's not really a theory. Explicit realizations, explicit realizations, by this I mean take an explicit, let's say, uh, effective string theory, go to supermagnetic image, break supersymmetry, and to see what the spectrum is, it's difficult with these kind of realizations to uh, achieve to realize this kind of model. So it's very difficult, but from a pretty pragmatic point of view, this kind of model can, uh, in principle, be tested in accelerators. I have to finish on this. Not as easy. Now, there is another uh, issue which is in large, to a large extent related to this feature, landscape hmm? feature, which is this is the issue of modular stabilization. I told you that the compact space of things theory is actually dynamical the space, and uh, all of the uh, uh, ways of this compact space can release this, are described by, uh, by fields, which are called modular fields. These are, these are uh, scalar fields, most of them. Uh, from a four-dimensional language point of view or uh, other kind of fields which typically modular fields well, what do they mean modular fields? modular fields that they have no, no potential they have zero mass and no potential this is what is called a modular stabilization one, this is one of the biggest problems of uh, string phenology if you want string theory is a lot of fields around us not only gauge fields, not only gravity a lot of fields which modify Newton uh, gravity in an unacceptable way because they are massless, because they couple like gravitation more or less. So it's, in a in certain sense, they are like uh, Brasnicki series, if you want, generalization of gravity type series. So what you have to do is to give them a mass. It turns out that putting this kind of fluxes in compact space, and now I'll, I'll talk about a different type of flux which will, which will be described later on by Bernd, I think. Uh, you can have different types of fluxes <coughs> in the compact space and the kind of fluxes which people did concentrate a lot in recent years are field strength with three indices, three forms <coughs> in various spectra of the theory integral of the compact three space is uh, quantized again and what it turns out is that when you include these fluxes in your effective theory in four dimensions, effective supergravity, as I told you, the effective low energy theory coming from a string theory is a supergravity theory, which is described typically by, in effective theory language, by some functions, one of them is the superpotential, like in noble supersymmetry, there is a <coughs> function for superpotential, 
It turns out that these functions, these moduli fields, which I denote them, some of them are S, S and U, these are part, part of the moduli fields coming from the string theory. They get a potential, they get a square potential and also a scalar potential, with a, a minimum, so they are stabilized, they get a mass just by putting this flux in the compact space. <coughs> if you want these fluxes are compatible, if you want to put just some values, discrete values of these fields, which means that these fields are indeed stabilized. So there is a relation between the same objects, fluxes, which generate this huge number of vacua, and modular stabilization, which is needed anyway in order to make contact with uh, real physics. In addition to already discussed, fluxes can break partly or completely supersymmetry, for example, because they couple different into modern fermions. The difference between this kind of fluxes and the magnetic field I discussed in the beginning is that this, the, the sequatization is not available for this kind of fluxes. So this kind of fluxes which received a lot of attention in the recent couple of years because they can stabilize, in particular, even the, the Dilaton field of string theory, which is coupling itself. All these techniques are based on superiority techniques, so it's a little bit less under control compared to the uh, uh, fluxes I discussed at the beginning. Now, by doing this kind of, uh, by putting this kind of fluxes, you stabilize a lot of fields, uh, a lot of moduli fields, but not all of them typically. There are some type, some type of moduli which needs um, uh, additional ingredients, and some of these additional ingredients can be, for, can be, for example, uh, some opportunity <coughs> effects on the gate theory sector. The, uh, the idea here is that, let me call T, uh, one of these uh, moduli fields is not stabilized. If the gauge coupling of a certain asymptotically free gauge group is determined by this uh, field T, and if you have a gauge of compensation of low energy, it will be like in QCD, but at a different energy scale, much higher, you generate a non-perturbative potential, which can be described in a supersymmetric way by a superpotential describing by this field, because this uh, potential depends on the gauge coupling, basically. So, in a non-perturbative way, you get a dependence of this potential on these moduli, moduli fields. When you include this into the effective Lagrangian, you will realize now that you can, and you combine with the fluxes which we discussed before, it is possible in principle to stabilize all moduli of a string theory. And this kind of uh, approach was pushed forward by the uh, Krashen collaborators. Uh, so this is a program which is, I think, very, very promising with, in the sense that you, it allows us to describe uh, effective C models with all moduli stabilized. So it's the first step towards discussing real uh, terminology. The drawback of it, the drawback is that the, uh, this relies on uh, mostly superiority techniques and not really the string uh, purist techniques. Uh, one of the results of this kind of approach is that uh, it is possible. It is possible in the first step when you do this kind of uh, uh, add this kind of non-perturbative effects, you generically get a homological quantum which is negative uh, and a square symmetric minimum generically, which is not acceptable, of course. And uh, there are various ways in order to. Uh, get around this result in order to find a positive cosmological constant. <coughs> it's not important to discuss it right here, uh, right now here. The important thing is that when you do this, you get, for example, a potential which has a cosmological constant which is, let's say, slightly positive. This is possible. However, in all cases, you'll always have a, what is called a runaway minimum. In other words, the minimum is zero cosmological constant where this model I think goes to infinity. So in all examples we know uh, nowadays in which you can get by this kind of techniques a positive cosmological constant, this kind of vacuum is metastable. Uh, this kind of framework was also uh, started to be studied from the point of view of particle physics in the sense that you can try to put a real uh, standard model, a specific standard model, 
in models with complete uh, modular stabilization, try to break square symmetry, compute soft terms, look at the terminology, and try to make predictions. Okay, I think I'm not saying anything about the last part, and I go to the conclusions. I just wanted to say for the last part that it is possible to, to, to uh, describe this kind of huge number of vector in a pure field theory settings by just describing having field theories with a very large number of vacua. Some of these uh, examples can also be related to some fluxes from a hard dynamic perspective. I'm not with this here. This can be useful in the sense that if you have a purely four dimensional description, you can control better the computations. And then we just go to the conclusions. Uh, the conclusions are somehow not respecting the order I discussed. So, uh, first of all, uh, before talking about landscape, so the models with fluxes, which were part of the landscape picture, like the models with intersecting brains, were just <coughs> experimental fields. Uh, actually it turns out to be also the simplest one, and this uh, I'll also discuss much more in detail, and also the simplest one, uh, and the closest one, to the standard model spectrum interactions. <coughs> so you see there are several kind of arguments pointing to different, uh, by different kind of arguments, pointing somehow towards model, models, three models with fluxes. They are the simplest one, they produce a large number of vacua, they can be combined with the other fluxes to, to stabilize or moduli, and moreover, they are the simplest one which produce the spectrum of standard model interactions. Not exactly standard model, but very close. There is a problem I didn't discuss at all, which is not part of this talk, but when we talk about supersymmetry breaking, uh, this is a problem that is still an open problem in string theory. We still have a lot of things to understand. So let me not comment about this part. Now, there is a good progress in modular stabilization. This was a part of a string terminology project which was for years to a large extent neglected. Stabilized all moduli was considered to be uh, very, very difficult in the past. And with the, uh, the new techniques of the flux compactifications, it, becomes, it became uh, a, pro a realistic program to stabilize all moduli, even if there are a lot of, a lot of details which are still uh, not under control and not very here. And this picture with a large number of vacua, or if you want the landscape picture, also can produce some phenological scenarios which are testable, <coughs> like the one which I present like speed supersymmetry. So this picture can inspire some scenarios, it also inspire or produce other kind of scenarios. The big problem of this kind of picture is the calculability. It's very hard, <coughs> it's very, very hard to know what kind of generic uh, consequence of this, high, this kind of picture, the huge number of vacua is, and uh, it's very hard to test it. So this kind of logical scenario, even uh, speed per symmetry, even if very, if you want, uh, uh, old and wild from a theoretical perspective, has the virtue of somehow being testable. And the physical realizations of this kind of uh, last picture, I think, are welcome because it improves the calculability, which is needed in order to really uh, try to make uh, predictions to be tested uh, from this, uh, all these uh, models with large number of This This one shambo, which you mentioned in the beginning, which is about the depth of the t uh, surely the percent value is not important, but anyway, how do you estimate this number? Basically, what you do is to estimate what is the, uh, if you want to estimate how many fluxes you can have in a generic compact space, what kind of quanta of flux you can, you, can, uh, uh, you can have. If you have, for example, something like uh, 200 different kind of fluxes, for example, and each quanta can go from 1 to 10, you can get something like, uh, like this. But I can have 500 or clubs, right? So, any number. <coughs> no, the, uh, the, the number of different fluxes you can have is related to topological properties of the compact space. 
So these are not completely arbitrary. And one other question. And, uh, well, you mentioned that we find some pattern in this theory, which uh, in some sense uh, model uh, the spectrum and interaction is not What is the novel? I think nobody knows. For that, it is fair to know that none of this is known. There are models which are very, very close to the standard model, but always contain something more. It contains more things, uh, particles, contain additional, typically non higher matter. Uh, people, you know, are discussing the number of standard model like vacua, but uh, my point of view is that before having one, which is discovered exactly the standard model, it's hard to estimate. Kind of, I don't think it's possible. Okay, let's take some questions.